What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hollywood Already Did It Presents, our Marvel pair-up show. As always, I'm your host, Blake Schultz, and with me is Jamie Jura. Hello. And Terrence Tatum. Hello, everyone. And if you are a longtime listener and probably a no-time caller, because this is a podcast, not an old-timey radio show where that would work, you know exactly what you're in for. And if you are a new listener, then what this is is a spinoff of our main podcast, Hollywood Already Did It, where we discuss reboots, remakes, sequels, and adaptations, and instead are pairing up every Marvel Disney Plus show with the history of whatever that show is about. So with WandaVision, it was sitcoms, with Falcon the Winter Soldier, it was Buddy Cop movies, Loki, time travel. Now we are in Marvel's What If? So of course we are looking at the multiverse of Marvel movies with the history of Marvel's non-MCU films. This week will be our seventh episode of Marvel What If? I think one that we've been waiting for this whole time, as well as the history of the Punisher movies before our finale, because I thought there were 10 episodes instead of nine, because why would because that I have not our, been a thing? Our eighth? This is the eighth one. Oh. We are in the penultimate episode, right before the finale. All of the pins are showing up. We have What If Ultron won. Uh, guys, take it away. What did you think? Terrence? You know, it's funny, because I've, I've been struggling through this What If. There are some episodes that I really like. like I like the Hank Pym episode, and I like, uh, of course, the Black Panther episode. I was like, oh, these are cool. But I never, I don't think I'll, I would have ever watched these again until this episode. This episode was the first episode that I was like, ah, this is what I've always wanted. Because it has that blend of being a badass action sequence as well, but also still giving me something that I've never actually seen before. And I, this is the first time that, be honest, I've been, a lot of these times I've been like doing other things while I'm watching these episodes. I'm like, all right, I'm on my phone, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm writing no up. This is the first time I was like, I'm, what is happening? I am 100% invested. And I, it sucks that it took the eighth episode for that to sort of get me all the way in, like some of the live action ones have. But this is the episode that I was like, oh, what is happening? Him, Ultron breaking the, the, the wall of the multiverse and this, like, oh no, I can see you now. And I'm here and we're doing this. That was just bananas to me. And them just battling from sequence to sequence to sequence and, jo- and, and changing worlds, just seeing random stuff of like worlds that we'll never, possibly never get to see with Steve Rogers being a president in the background. I was like, what is, this is great. I love everything that they are giving me. Why couldn't we have this maybe three episodes sooner? Um, was sort of where I sat with this. But no, I thoroughly, this is by, this is by hands down, not even a question. I love this episode the best uh, of everything that we've gotten with What If. And I can't wait to next week. I do wish, I know we'll probably mention it. I've been annoyed a lot of times when we'll get one actor who is from the live action stuff doing it in a non-voice actor. So the Blake Bell to direct Jim Renner, that's fine. Spader not being Ultron really bugged me. And like the fact that he was trying to put on a Spader affectation bothered me even more. Uh, I wish we either could have A, just had him do something completely different or we got Spader, but choose a lane because that- It's a little distracting when they're trying to impersonate whoever it is they're performing as. Because like with Lake Bell as Black Widow, she's just doing her Black Widow. And it works really well. And I think they got really lucky with uh, the actor, the voice actor playing Iron Man because he does sound similar enough to Robert Downey Jr. And he also, I think, is taking his own, like, I don't need to just do what RDJ did. I can do my own thing. Right. Because, like, why would you ever try to do that? It's like in impersonations. Like, SNL always has a presidential impersonation. And that all the other impersonations are, like, you're not really doing W. Bush. You're doing Will Ferrell's W. Bush. And we're on an imitation of an imitation of a copy of a copy of a copy. And with this guy, sometimes I was like, oh, man, he's really, like, hitting it. And other times I was like, oh, this is just kind of distracting. I really wish, because this Ultron is so different right. from Spader's Ultron that it would have made sense to just go do your, do own, your thing. own thing with it because you're yeah. sometimes you're Galactus and sometimes you're Vision and sometimes you're this. And did, 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 did. Like why even try to do Ultron from Age of Ultron? But uh, yes, I agree with that point. This is the third podcast I've talked about this on this week. But, uh, so sorry to the two Jamie Jarek fans out there, but uh, I just, I, I don't care about any of the other voice changes, but but changing James Bader just doesn't work for me. It's And, and, and I said this in the, in the past, I think part of it is that Ultron is a voice role. It's 
it's that's what Ultron is. It's not. Yeah, we just, don't actually see a physical yeah. person. That's mm-hmm. true. I think it, that's part of it, but also it's just because it's James fucking Spader and and he's a king. Uh, but uh, but other than that issue, I think this I think it, it, this was not my favorite episode. Party Thor is my favorite episode, but this is the best episode for sure. Uh, I can recognize the difference. Um, and uh, so uh, yeah, I, I I you know I right now I agree with the that I wish this would have come sooner. But the fact that this show is going to get more seasons, I think like down the line, as long as they keep doing it this way it'll be fine that it took this long because that's a normal first season thing, you know, get like, you know, it's like shows like Buffy did a lot of monster of the week before in the first season before they got really going. And then in in the scheme of things, that's fine. So as long as this continues, I'm going to be okay with how long it took, but if they go right back to it in season two and takes all season again, I'm going to be frustrated because I'm like you, I'm just like very on on the whole thing. I mean, that's, kind of how agents of shield even was it took us a while to get to that first big reveal and then we were in it for a decade and i defend Uh, the first season all the time because so but at the time i understand why it was frustrating and i'm going to be defending this first season the whole time because i am (laughs) enjoying it so much it is not look it's not as good as anything they've done in live action and i recognize that and that is because it's not building to some grander scheme we're not sitting here every week being like Mephisto and where is Loki going and who was Sylvie and who's the villain and the setup and the bop, 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 which I was after four three seasons of television and a few movies this year alone I was ready for something where I was like I can just put my feet up and watch a person throw a shield and go home I am I'm tired I'm ex- I did it for a decade of my life I'm gonna do it for another 20 years of my life it was nice for a while, just be like, superheroes are fun sometimes. We don't need, and now here we are being like, well, there's a bigger picture, you dumb <laughs> idiot, Lake. You thought we weren't gonna do something giant, you fool. Uh, so here we are, I'm loving it. My favorite is still the third episode because I still think Hank Pym as a serial killer changed the genre of the MCU in a way we had never really done. And having like a murder mystery element to it was something cool. This is what every, what the people want though. This is the big galactic Easter egg hunt. Oh, he's eating a galaxy. Oh, that's giant throwing fists with the watcher, laser eyes. Kate, this is, this is what you go to the theater for. And I am here in like 2004 where I'm like, sometimes a story is fun. <laughs> No, I still love this episode. I've loved all of it. I like when we get to see what other people would do with the Infinity Stones, because I really think one of the lost opportunities was Thanos breaking them, because I was like, but I want to see, like, what does the Soul Stone do when it's just the Soul Stone? What can other people do with the Time Stone power, reality? We never really played with these rocks the way I was hoping we would, and seeing Ultron, who doesn't take any damage when he uses it, Skynet goes crazy. Really, every step of this way was like my kind of nonsense. We're in a post apocalyptic robot, what if Terminator 1 world? You got Jeremy Renner with one arm and a cloak. Great. He needs an explanation. I'm like, cool. Thanks. I'm I good. don't care where he got the oh, invisibility yeah, cloak because this me. is all fake. <laughs> this is, uh, it's fine. I loved that. I loved getting Skynet references, seeing the map overlay it. I was like, oh, we just saw Terminator and film at a theater and I'm ready for some more Robo Wars. Bring it Thanos just get destroyed. Just like, oh, all right, that was very easy. Cool. This is the new like contentious point on the internet. And I am an old man now where I'm not in classrooms being like, well, who would win? Cap or Spider-Man? That was the big one at my GameStop. They were like, well, you know, he'd web his shoes. Well, then Cap would just jump out of his shoes and he'd fight without his baba. And I was like, I don't, I don't have the time for this anymore. Uh, this is a 30 minute, 40 minute cartoon. We just got to get through some of it. Right. But it is also a very simple thing when they're like, but why wouldn't Vision have done that? Because Vision's not a killer. He's not a murderer. And right. <laughs> they also had made this giant plan because they didn't realize you could do that, where I'm sure if someone was like, hey, uh, new plan. What if he comes through the portal and we just shoot him? About that. Because like Thanos is by all rhyme and reason not like a god anyways. Like right. really 
you could probably just shoot him in the head. He's just a tactician. So when he's right. coming into a world that has been annihilated, he's going to get annihilated. Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with that either. I thought it was funny. I, made me laugh. I thought it was hilarious. I think there's too many things. Too serious about that kind of stuff. There are too many things that were happening in the in the live action Marvel world for us to just take that easy road out. Uh, mainly, a pulse part of that too is that Thanos is related family wise to the people that we cared about. Where in this world, no one gives a shit about Thanos. He's just a, a random being. How often have we explored like, but what if Superman was the bad guy? And it's like, oh, he would win. He would destroy. That's everyone. the whole thing. Game or game. he would just correct the Leaning Tower of. Pisa, because uh, that, that's what happens in, in Superman 3. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that's, I'll never get over that. Like, I, evil Superman, the first thing he decides to do to, when he's evil is is tip a building a little, to make it Still a question how Richard Pryor wound right? up there, but yes, that is that is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, we, we, we've answered this question the other way. Why do we have to now be like, oh, and it's like, yeah, totally, 100% they could have done this, but like, We've gotten even, to a Thanos point. Thanos even says it to Strange when he's like, "You never used your time stone." Right. Like. Yeah, we've gotten to a point where people just can't enjoy stuff; they have to overanalyze mm-hmm. everything, and that's that. That's annoying to me. I would hate to live in a world where I can't just be like this was just fucking fun. I'm in it. I mean, let's do it. It used to be part of the fun of like you'd read your comics, you'd go have lunch, you'd be like, "Oh, but like, what if Wolverine and Superman fought? Who did? Who would win?" And yeah. oh man, and then like. It's like I said, now I'm like, I'm at an older age where I'm like, I don't, it's all good. I'm going to buy a Sega and a Nintendo because I have an income. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded very privileged of me. But, you know, you have to realize in the 90s, we had a lot more money than we have now. I don't have multiple systems anymore. No. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I thought it was a great episode. I liked uh, seeing the Watcher fight. I'm very excited to see now that we're just going to, do what he does in the comics for a watch who's like i'm not supposed to interfere but i'm gonna do it but i'm here yeah uh we're going back to evil dr strange who's just been sitting in a prison of loneliness which i how love bro- that how broken is that man yeah that's gonna be fun i mean you know and now like we're back in it now i'm like okay so what is it gonna be the watch is gonna assemble this team and in an episode i thought we had more but covid made episode 10 go into season two which either means giant cliffhanger or we're gonna have two episodes in one because i was like i want to see him assemble this team in a whole episode and then the final fight yeah but who knows maybe kang's gonna show up and beat ultra or we're just gonna have these guardians this also tells me that like yeah next season is just gonna be like captain carter episode two the charles star lord episode two we're just gonna these are the nine worlds we're gonna play with and we'll maybe add a few here we'll add a couple there. here and there yeah uh but i think it's great it's fun we've got one more left and then we have a long break until christmas hawkeye time which is also going to be yeah, fantastic yeah but of course that's not the only thing we're here to talk about guys let's go back in time first to 1989 then 2004 and then 2008 in what is going to be the most boring version of Back to the Future you've seen. Uh, (laughs) Nothing too important happened in 1989. I was born, as was the feature film, The Punisher. Back when New World Entertainment, who we've talked about many, many times, owned the rights to Marvel, made the first movie, nothing very exciting or interesting. They simply made a Punisher film and then didn't have money to theatrically release it in the United States, which is a lot sadder than it is interesting. (laughs) There's yeah. no story to that. They were just out of money. We have no money. A movie. Yeah. I don't know that that's ever happened again in the history of movies, but here we are. They then would sell the rights to Live Entertainment, a company that would eventually be called Lionsgate, which is very ironic because they just didn't keep the Punisher license. Another company called Artisan Entertainment did in the year 2000. They acquired the rights to 15 characters for TV and film, including our first Punisher. The interesting part about this movie, we talked about a few episodes ago, somebody at New Line once said to Marvel, just do it yourself. You don't need us. Go make movies. This is the first time they were an independent release as an equity owner, meaning that they would contribute characters and creative support to lower budget movies in exchange for a financial financial stake in the negative cost, which for those who don't know is the 
net expense to make the movie sans release. So really they just got to go make some really cheap stuff. So cheap, in fact, that the first director for the first Punisher movie noticed that he was given $33 million to make his movie. The average budget for an action film at that time was $60 million. He was also given 52 days to make the movie, half the time it usually takes to make an action movie. So that was the world they were living in at the time. During the middle of production, Lionsgate bought Artisan and had nothing to do with this Punisher movie, though their logo is all over it. As if they Everywhere. had something to do with it. Well, I mean, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you buy something and then put your bumper sticker on it? Yeah. Who cares if you had nothing to do with it? Immediately after the release of the movie, Lionsgate said, we're making another one. It took them a long time to get the script right. Thomas Jane just said it wasn't working. He didn't like the script. He leaves in 2007. They bring in Lexi Alexandra. They're going to now do it a reboot. They've got a new actor. They don't care about the first one. We're going to make an 80s movie fun time. And that's pretty much it. This is the same year that Iron Man was released. So after we talk about our thoughts in this movie, it's going to be interesting to be like, where we were in 2004 and 2008, we've talked about in other episodes, that The Punisher just kind of stands next to all of that as it happens, almost influencing more things like Deadpool and R-rated movies and the Netflix world. But we will get to that in a minute. What do you guys think of these, 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 this trilogy of the errors? Punisher the trilogy. Punisher <laughs> um, it's funny. The so Punisher Frank Castle is one of my favorite characters. Period. If I'm doing a top five ranking, he's in my top five. Um, I love him. I, I think it's interesting if you think about it. He's the only character, single character, not a group like X Men or, or, or Fantastic Four, but he's the only character that has had multiple. Uh, single Marvel characters had multiple live action attempts outside of Spider-Man. Like he's the number two person who's had that, as many attempts. Three, three live actions in a television series, which is incredible. And a lot of that is because, well, one, it's easy to make these type of films. Like, oh, it's a simple revenge film. I can go ahead and tack my name, put Marvel across that. It's a built-in audience. And two, revenge films typically sell. They're always an easy way to do it. The budget can stay low. Uh, the 89 film, I have a love-hate with. I think Dolph Lundgren's fun. It has absolutely nothing to do with the Punisher outside of saying that it's the Punisher. <laughs> He's fighting the Yakuza. You'd be like, sure, okay. I don't know why that is. Terrence, I spent most of my life just thinking that that was a movie called The Punisher <laughs> and had nothing to do with this franchise. You didn't know it other than hearing him say, oh, you're Frank Castle? Cool. Nothing else resembles anything we're close to The Punisher in there. Um, but I, I owned it because I was like, oh, I, I, I was a sucker for those old 80s revenge films. And I'm like, yeah, this, this fits into that wheelhouse. Cool. Um, but it's not, it doesn't, it's a good movie, but it's not a good Marvel film. It's like a good revenge flick if you ignore the fact that it has nothing to do with that. The 2004 Thomas Jane one is the first time that I walked out of the theater and I was just like, something's wrong. And I first time that I noticed tone and tone in the movie was didn't mesh with what they were saying and what was happening in there didn't match with what I, what was actually happening on the screen. Like his, his family being murdered seemed odd happening on like a Miami, on a beach. It just was like, this doesn't seem like this fits in correctly. Or like the fight sequence that he has with Kevin Nash playing the Looney Tunes, like that operatic song behind that. It's like something is jarring with the two of these don't mesh. And that happened throughout the entire film that I walked away. It was like, I don't know. Thomas Jane and John Travolta are in two completely different movies. Um, and I don't know if at any point in time in this film did they realize that these don't work together. Work together. Um, and I typically like John Travolta. I know Jamie's going to speak about how much she loves John in a second, but it, this, I don't know what the hell this movie was. There was a lot of stuff happening together that just didn't make sense. I also didn't like the fact, as a person who was a Frank fan, I know Frank doesn't play with his food as much as they had <laughs> they had the Punisher playing with them as long. He would have killed them. Like, I'm, I'm not going to set you up to play these long con games. I'm going to shoot you in the face and then this is going to be over with. But they had him setting up people to do these games and it just didn't make, it didn't drive with the character. Warzone, I actually really enjoy. Um, I like it a lot. It is incredibly violent, um, but it is one of the few films that I think sort of gets to some of the emotionality of, uh, of, uh, of, of Frank when he, he makes a mistake, if anyone hasn't seen it, makes a mistake and kills an FBI agent who's undercover. And his whole thing is like, I, I gotta quit, I'm done. Like I, the one person that I'm, I'm doing this all for is for this. And I was like, oh, there's some emotionality here. And it's gr gruesomely violent, 
Dominic West is chewing up scenery uh, as, 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 as Jigsaw. We get Doug Hutchinson, who was in the Green Mile, is one of the worst, <laughs> the worst human beings humanly possible. He shows up as Looney Bin Jim. And there's just some fun characters. His use of colors is great. It's super violent. Uh, I dig it. And it's one of the first times that I think we actually see Marvel Knights on any of the opening sequences of these Marvel films. I, I wish this film had done better. Uh, I know Lionsgate really didn't know what to do with this film. Like they had, they almost removed Lexi from it once they got the post. They didn't know if they wanted to make it a PG-13 or R. They dumped it into December, which was one of those weird, that's where Oscar films come out. So it's definitely not going to make any money there. You don't so think it, this was an Oscar worthy film? No, <laughs> not at all. It's a fun film, but it is far from an Oscar worthy film. Um, Maybe the Oscars could use a little more fun. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta so this get is, those kids watching I think Dominic Oscar. West gave an Oscar worthy performance he was having you could tell that Dominic West was having a bowl in this movie um, and it's Dominic and, and, and Doug Hutchinson were both having fun I like Ray Stevenson I think Thomas Jane probably cared more about the role of Punisher he was just in a, the worst film I, I but I think Ray Stevenson I can take or leave him you can at the way that Warzone is done you could put anybody in that role that the way that Ray performed it and it would have been fine i just think the movie as a whole is just more fun and entertaining than than than, than the 2004 one um i like the, sh the live action netflix show but we'll talk about that in a bit for me uh i had never seen any before this week any punisher content other than i saw the 2004 movie in theaters because john chagall's in it uh, I had never seen any episodes of, of John because uh, I hadn't watched Daredevil season two or Punisher. Uh, so I, I know the basics of the character, uh, but I'm not, a, I haven't read any comics. Like it's definitely a, a, a weak spot for me. So uh, I watched all three movies in a row one night. Mm. Uh, what, what an intense evening. That's a uh, lot. I loved, 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 loved the John Lundgren movie. <laughs> First of all, I, so previously, like I've seen every Expendable movie a million times. I've seen Rocky Four, but that's really it for me and Dolph. I've never, and, and this is like my first time, uh, I just watched this movie called Dark Angel that he's in, which is really a bizarre cop meets aliens movie. Uh, and one, I'm realizing that he was hot back then. Uh, and I'm really, I'm excited to watch more of his stuff. I got I mean, two, I, I got two movie. random films for you. Uh, okay. One Universal Soldier, you have to watch. Okay. Dolph you do have to watch. Didn't we and do Universal? So no, we didn't. We did not. And equally as off the mark as Punisher, Masters of the Universe with Dolph Lundgren. Okay, I'm sure I'll love that. Is is just um, batshit crazy. Yeah. But continue. So I I'm so like you know me. I love 80s action. It's it's one of my favorite genres. So even though, yeah, this is not really a Marvel movie, it's still my kind of movie. And just slapping the name Marvel on it makes it even more fun for me. Uh, so I loved every second of that. It is definitely superior to the two movies that followed. I blocked out the 2004 movie severely. And that is because, yes, I consider myself John Travolta's biggest fan in the universe. John Travolta once said to me, you're my new biggest fan. Uh, this is a fact. So uh, I, um, that movie is, I, I off, Dark Phoenix is my least favorite Marvel movie, but The Punisher 2004, I think, is the worst Marvel movie. <laughs> it is bad. The, you, you nailed it, Terrence, with the tone thing. The tone is all over the place. Being from Sarasota, Florida, I love that it took place in Tampa. It was so bizarre. Um, that was a trip. Uh, but Thomas Jane, yeah, I don't, don't think he knew what he was doing. I know enough about the Punisher to know that like these weird games he was playing don't make any sense. He tricks John Travolta into thinking his gay best friend is having an affair with his wife, and we spend so much time on that. Who cares? I mean, yeah, I, you'd think that it would help me to have this weird gay Travolta plot. It does not. I There was no point to this. There were barely any like good memorable kills and isn't that the friggin' point? Uh, I just, wow, I thought this movie was absolute garbage. And, I, and, and the fact that Travolta couldn't save it for me is that means a lot, audience members, that, that how bad. It, it really does. Is. If you don't know, like, they need to <laughs> mark for John Travolta is really high. If she's not effing with this, there's a lot going wrong. Wow, it's bad. Um, and the 2008 was a bit of a step up. Uh, I they had some great kills, some really fun kills. I loved Dominic West. Oh my gosh, 
any villain role like that where someone is just having so much fun and like I, I'm in it 100%. Uh, the, as a movie overall, I didn't really like it. I, I thought it was kind of all over the place. I, I thought it was paced weird. Um, and Ray, like you said, Ray was fine. I think I, I, I yeah. liked him more than Thomas just because he, he was given like a tiny, tiny bit more to work with. Yeah. Um, but I, ultimately the movie was pretty forgettable but still way more i would watch it again mo- twice before I'd i go ever to said war zone. yeah i go to yeah. warzone way before i go into that 2004 yeah um it's it's still again didn't didn't really like it but it had at least some redeeming qualities which is more than we can say about the 2004 movie uh so but i really enjoyed this journey and like getting to uh and you know i did a little research learning a little more about the character learning why most of these are not correct uh and so uh but i'm mainly just glad that the Dolph movie is in my life now because that will be a revisit for sure so, oh, and I also, yeah, I, I, I know we're going to talk a little bit about John, but I did watch the first episode of The Punisher just to get an idea. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, even, I even just the one episode, I'm looking up because it, it's still paused. It's, still on, it's, it's yeah, paused um, on my screen. <laughs> yeah, um, you can, I mean, he's superior to everyone, even just as an actor. Uh, that's helpful but just you can tell the character makes more sense it is funny though like watching four punisher things in a row like how many dead wife flashbacks we have to sit through oh they have killed it's funny i mean we always laugh about like bruce's parents being murdered and spidey's uncle being murdered but they've killed a lot of frank's frank's wives Mm -hmm. and like his kids numbers sometimes change change. just one son two kids three kids his whole oh, yeah. family that's another thing about the 2004 his whole the family that shot up his one. whole family reunion he's like it starts with mom and then they fucking kill us Every, everybody like, his, his third cousins are getting murdered like that was so dumb i could like they that whole first 30 minutes they spent on that i was like oh my god that they was murder way everyone. too i rightly yeah. expected the dog to just run out there like oh shoot the fucking dog too let's do it they really beat uh game of thrones to that red wedding i mean <laughs> it, that's just what it is but that's easily my favorite of, of the flashbacks. That's the variant Punisher that I want to see, but without the rest of that movie. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. The 1989 one is fine as a 1989 Dolph Lundgren film. It's perfectly fine and I enjoy watching it. I don't have anything else to add to the 2004 conversations. I just don't care about that movie. <laughs> I, remember, I remember seeing it with my parents because like the Punisher is such an interesting character because he's like he's broken through just like comic book fandom like everyone knows the punisher and that skull and when it's used right and when it's used wrong and like it was a character that my parents were excited to see and that ending where he's like on the bridge and he's like so if you're out there murderers rapists i'll find you and i remember my mom leaving just and all three of us being like what was that ending what tagline is this? What it, like, like it was. It was so like what people think like Batman does at the end, but in this like Shakespearean, bizarre way. Which they had not earned from anything else that happened in that no, film. No, <laughs> it's so weird. The yeah. tone is all over the place. I like Warzone. I think it's a I great mean, bombastic yeah. action-packed time. I don't care about anything else. But that does bring us, we haven't talked about the Netflix stuff at all because outside of like the universal TV era, I kind of felt that this was part of the MCU that we were getting to. But I think one interesting thing that this character proves once he gets into the Daredevil show and his own show is how some characters can almost work as an antagonist to another character to like push them forward, which is something the MCU started doing a lot. Ironically, all in the same year. We had Batman versus Superman, Civil War, and Punisher season, or uh, Daredevil season two, all of which were dealing with like heroes fighting each other and also the world responding to them. Mm -hmm. And having the Punisher in that, the same way in the Marvel Civil War comics, having a character who is just like, no, you're all wrong. Kill them. And then the villains are gone forever. Really helps characters like Daredevil, Spider-Man, Captain America, Iron Man, 
like forge into who they are and like challenge that point of view. You Watching, get a, you get a stronger sense of their ideology with Frank being on the opposite side of that. Like just watching that scene of him and Daredevil on the roof of like, well, you hit him and they come back and I hit him and they stay down was the biggest like, oh, he's making very good points. He's not wrong. <laughs> it was, and it also shows, I think, that characters like that that are complicated. We've now seen three film versions of them. One of them is just like an 80s movie before we really did Marvel. But as we talked about around 2004 was when Marvel said, we have to do these characters the way they are in the comics. And the 2004 movie speaks to that more. But I think this is a character that we learn in the Netflix shows needs that like time to cook. Otherwise you do kind of end up with a vengeful war zone fun, which is great. I love a good violent action movie, but like there's so much more to Frank Castle and the Punisher and that idea that like a two hour movie can really pull off. Yeah, there's a lot of meat on the bone of Frank Castle and the series do a good job of, of giving all of that. But in the film, you're either going to get, I'm just a straight murderer and I'm killing you all, or you're going to get, I'm moping and drinking a bottle of whiskey the entire time, Frank. And there's more in between that and layers to that. But in the film, you're right, it's so short. Like we gotta get in and get out. We're gonna pick and choose which battle we take for this. Right, and I, I think part of the problem that almost all three Punisher movies have had is that they've tried to do all of them at once, which was a mistake that a lot of early comic book movies made because the comic book medium, like TV, goes on and on and on. They're right. soap operas. They They're, never really yep. stop. And so once we started really getting Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Daredevil, all these characters that we won't have time to get into on this show, we really got to see like, oh, not only are these like R-rated mature dark stories interesting, when you put them in this medium instead, they really hit home and they hit harder than anything we get in the other movies. And now I feel like we're in this weird world where like all of those characters are like, what's going to happen? Where do we, we want put that them? season four of Daredevil, but we haven't gotten an R-rated MCU property, but also these were stories that like flirted with the MCU. Like they were, mm -hmm. they were like the girl next door for them, where they were like aware of it and they gave everybody cute nicknames. Sending but they you weren't flowers, gonna go over. But I'm not acknowledging, yeah, I'm not acknowledging you. Like I saw your DMs, but I'm not, I'm not yeah. responding back to you. Uh, yeah, that, that's what sucked. And that, and that is what's fright, like scary. Cause I also rewatched all of these uh in this time and i sat there kind of sad and they were all over like crap where do these go now like how do we get these now like that marvel's knights local made me giddy and i'm like i will, won't see that again i think hopefully we'll just get back to like it was miramax right that was disney's r-rated label for a long time correct. like it might be time now that they own 20th century studios to make something of that and give us some sort of r-rated marvel world that does play with these characters but like i don't think you're cutting off an audience i think there's a, clearly every other week these characters trend on twitter with people being like matt murdoch's going to be in spider-man right. jessica jones is going to be over here and, da, 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 and moon knight's going to have punisher in them and blade's going to be r-rated and they're all going to hang out in this r-rated world and deadpool's coming so i'm like clearly there's people are jonesing for this right and I'm wondering if maybe they use Deadpool sort of as that that gateway to just test the test the audience and like, all right, this is going to be R-rated. Maybe we should create a lane for just that stuff, like the Ghost Riders, the Blades, the Moon Knights, just put there. It can still be connected. We can flirt back and forth when they're in a, the Disney Disney protocol or Disney stuff. We have to kind of soften it a little bit. But when they're doing their own thing, they can be as buck wild as they want to. I think that's the world they should play in. I hope we get that. I just I'm afraid we might not. I don't it's think also, will, which is a bummer. Like the, just the Disney of it all. Uh, like Kevin Feige, thus far has made, has said they're only interested in doing their and doing Deadpool yeah. rated R. But you know, who knows? There was a time when we didn't think Spider Man would be in the MCU. You know, who anything's possible. Yeah, I've so far been proven wrong on every mm -hmm. single like. Well, Sony's not going to budge. You think, spoiler alert, Venom's going to make it into the MCU. I've <laughs> constantly been just... Yeah. <laughs> it's not even worth listening to me, but I'm like, they're never going to... Are you getting me? Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. canon confirmed? Never happening. <laughs> and there's going to... Tomorrow, now that I've said that, they'll be like, it's coming. Colson's okay. back. They better. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, who knows? So it'll be interesting to see, but we're also kind of seeing the first um, time in, in the superhero cinematic history where people want it to get connected. We're in 2008 with this last Punisher movie. And from here on out, like the Ghost Rider movies kind of get ignored. They don't like, no one really focused on them or talked about them. Every like Marvel's back to kind of collecting all their pieces again. And the Fantastic Four reboot gets kind of ignored. Everything that's not mm. interconnected is starting to be like, well, why isn't it connected? Why does it Spider-Man exist? Spider-Man reboots. Yeah. Unless you're X-Men, which have had that history before, we're now in the MCU world where they're like, I, why would I go see this Punisher movie? It's not going to connect it. And I always feel like X-Men was sort of a self-contained world, even within Marvel. They sort of always sort of did their own thing and had like 17 different spinoff comics within their own sort of like Gambit had his own thing and Bishop had his own thing. And like, that's just sort of how they always operated outside of the rest. So that's just par for the course. But yeah, it's interesting because this, I mean, obviously we talked about Warzone came out the same year as, as Iron Man. And you're like, yeah, that doesn't makes sense to me that which is die. also the same year as the dark knight and we haven't right. talked a lot about dc movies but this is also a movie now that came out when like every the rules of the game changed in, the, in, in between iron man and the dark knight the bar for superhero movies forever switched leaped up yeah and you know that's just where we are so it's interesting because i don't know how much these punisher movies affected the mcu in any way that we had not already talked about but it's interesting to look at because he does sort of operate almost like next to everything. So I feel like it would be very easy for them to do more with this. But you know, Disney likes money, so I'm sure they'll figure out something to do with it. They're not they're not going to go get all their characters back to not use them. It's not like there was an Infinity Stone that Thanos is like, I just want to have it. Yeah. Of Punisher all, was literally trending yesterday. Yes, it, of right. all their R-rated properties, the Punisher, the logo, the name of Frank Castle alone is enough. They're like, hey, maybe we should try this again because we're going to make money. Well, it's also it's like we said, I want to see these characters' ideologies get challenged. Civil War was fun because we pushed Cap and Iron Man into these corners of like what they really believe in. And once you get the Punisher on the board, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't want to be... Who is this guy? Is yeah, he a villain? Like, is he good? Is he bad? You know, we've talked about it sometimes when like the Punisher hangs out with the rest, like in Civil War, and Cap is like, I don't like this kid. This guy should not be around us at all. I want to see some of that because part of me agrees with what Frank is talking about, but part of me is like, man, Steve might be right. We should murder everyone. We might just ask a question. Well, and it's also fun to see the characters he respects. Like he likes Captain America a lot. It's like, oh, I just can't do it the way he does. It. Right. Like I, but I wish I could. Like he's the best of us. And I'm like, these are the interactions I want to start seeing where they, they are some people who are like, no, I just can't. That's not who I am. Right. But who knows? Maybe one day we'll get there. I didn't think we were going to see some sort of Ultron with a chest of infinity stones flying through worlds. One of them might have been Mustafar. Who knows? I doubt <laughs> it. It wasn't. But wouldn't that be fun? I do uh, like that idea. Uh, that, oh, why look. Not? I mean, That's I've been saying... I've said forever that I'm like, oh, I don't ever need to see Star Wars and Marvel crossover, but I also really want to see you Marvel gave it and Star me. Wars. Yes. <laughs> if you gave yeah, me an I'm animated... Right. What am I going to do? Not watch it? They're getting my $7 <laughs> a month. It doesn't matter. Here's the Star Wars Marvel crossover for you. I like yeah, it. I'm in it. <laughs> it, would, uh, it would be great. But that's our show, guys. So if you enjoyed listening, uh, hit subscribe to your podcast app or YouTube, wherever you are. Leave us a review, leave us a comment, let us know what you're thinking and feeling and how you're doing on a day-to-day basis at this moment. We want to know. But if you're going to do that, you should also leave us five stars because then we'll feel great. I'm at, as always, Blake. Tans is at Tans Tatum. Jamie is at Jamie Cinematics. We, of course, have the other Hollywood already did a show about reboots, remakes, sequels, and adaptations, which if you're here listening, the Venom Carnage episode should be up right next to this one on Monday. And Jamie is, of course, on Phase Zero at comicbook.com, where you can read her review of Venom 2, Let There Be Carnage. Terrence is everything else on our Hollywood Already Did It YouTube channel, the trailer reactions, reviews, and everything else. So we will see everybody next week for the last episode of the Marvel movie history before the next Marvel pair-up, because this apparently will never end. It's a thing. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>
uh, until we've talked about every possible genre of movie. <laughs> we will see everybody next week. <laughs>